Cool. So now we've got um, an amazing sermon from our amazing Aaron, who's back after a few weeks. Um, he was preaching ago, a few weeks ago, so um, he always brings a fantastic message. So just encourage him as he comes to share with us this morning. Just give him a big hand. Here's Aaron McGregor. Thank you very much. Very encouraging. How's everybody doing? Awesome. Yes, yeah, keep, keep Willie in prayer. And um, cause that's just quite tragic. I know he, had, he came down during the week, so uh, keep praying for him. Breakthrough. And uh, yeah, come along next week as well to see, you know, Connor's baptism. It's going to be a real shame to see him go, not this Connor. Uh, Connor Bothwick, he's done incredible, you know, having him part of this church has just been phenomenal. It's a shame to see him go. So I want to really um, witness him getting baptized and send them off on a, on a really, really good note. So I'm going to jump straight into the Word of God this afternoon. And if you've got a Bible, turn with me to John chapter 9. We're going to read from verses 1 to 7, and um, it's always good just to engage with the Word of God, so if you've got the Bible in your hand, just, you know, just read along with me. So, if you're, you're there? Good. So, it says this, as Jesus was walking along, he saw a man who had been blind from birth. Rabbi, his disciples asked him, why was this man born blind? Was it because of his own sins or his parents' sins? It was not because of his sins or his parents' sins, Jesus answered. This happened so the power of God could be seen in him. We must quickly carry out the tasks assigned us by the one who sent us. The night is coming and then no one can work. But while I am here in the world, I am the light of the world. Then he spat on the ground, made mud with the saliva, and spread the mud over the blind man's eyes. He told him, Go wash yourself in the pool of Siloam. Siloam means scent. So the man went and washed and came back seeing. Let's just pray. Father, we want to just come before you right now. And um, God, we just want to put off what's ever happened during the week. And Lord God, we want to just keep our eyes on you. God, just throughout this message, we just pray that in our own lives, Father God, that our eyes would be open even wider, that we would see the greater things that you have for us. In your mighty name. Amen. So as Rachel just sort of announced, you know, that, you know, I've been promoted and, you know, God's been so good in that, um, you, you know, I've been, you know, officially been signed off as a manager at Tesco and the, I know, right, and, you know, I've been appointed to the store here in Musselboro, so it's literally a five minute walk. Um, it actually takes me longer to drive to work than it would to walk. So if you ever hear me driving to work, I deserve a slap. Uh, and Ross is not, he said, so he'd more likely do it because it's my flatmate and I'll just avoid him. But, um, but, you know, even getting to that stage to, 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 you know, to being promoted and things like that, it was not an easy journey. It wasn't like, you know, yeah, you're just getting promoted just like that. There was, uh, you know, a few years ago when I, fi- when I finished university, it was like, do I, you know, is that a choice whether I just go and go somewhere else to work or I stay with Tesco? And um, basically I decided to stay and they, you know, I went for promotion then. And long story short, I got put on the program um, but then I got put to a, a store and the person who was supposed to be kind of mentoring me through the process, let's just say me and him didn't see eye to eye and it was just not a very, very good relationship. And that, because the relationship was so tight, I ended up n- not getting promoted. And, um, but before I left, he kind of left me with these very, very encouraging words. And it was this, you will never be a manager in a big store, ever. And, um... Why am I saying that? Because at that point in my life, you know, if someone could say something like that to me and I would swallow that, I would say, well, that must be true of my life. That is my reality. And I would buy that and that would be, you you know, and I I bought into that. But over the years, God done a work and God just sort of used me moving uh, moving around. And it kind of got to a stage with, with my life where I started to get a bit frustrated and go, I'm fed up with being where I'm at. I want to move ahead. And I just, I got to the stage where I thought, you know something, God, if nothing happens to me right now, you know, if I can't move ahead, I'm done with this company. I'm taking my degree and I'm going somewhere else. And I kind of really felt God say in that moment, trust me on this. And long story short, you know how that guy said I would never be a manager in a big store? Well, I got signed off in the largest store in Scotland. And, you know, I'm now, and, uh, you know, so everything that that was said over my life, 
Jesus done something to switch that around to, to do something incredible. And I'm saying that this morning, this afternoon, that whatever it was that was spoken over your life, that's bringing you down, that's bringing restriction, I want to tell you this, that that very thing God is going to use to do an incredible work in your life, to bring something phenomenal, to take you to places you've never been. So I want to just really look at this afternoon uh, as we get into the Word of God, uh, to take some practical lessons from this blind man and how we can start to turn those lies, the deceptions, the, you know, those things that were sown into your life that God can use to bring about incredible change. How good does that sound? Is that something you want? Let's do it. So when we look into what's going on in this, in this context with this blind guy, um, you know, the obvious thing about this man is that you know, he was blind. So for us, a very practical point in this would be to always identify whatever it is that's ruling your life. So my title for this message this afternoon is simply this, Jesus the Rule Breaker. What's ruling your life right now? What is it that's restricting you from stepping into all that God's called you for your life? What is it? I just pray that throughout this message that God will reveal that to you. You know, he doesn't reveal the whole thing, but he'll give you one thing. Go for that first. But I'll get into that as I, as I go on. Um, what is it that's ruling you negatively? What's the stronghold? What's the mindset? So in mine, I just swallowed the pill of you will never be, but God done something to go you can be. What is it in your life? So you understand this, that with a blind man, he was physically blind, but in the culture around him, you know, a religious spirit was what was at work within the lives of the Pharisees who were the religious leaders. They were the influencers at the time. But they themselves were so blind by religion that the only thing that they could do with this blind guy was to say, you're blind because of sin, therefore that is your lot in life. That's the message. How empowering and exciting would that be? But I love what Jesus done. Jesus broke those rules and he used the blind man to do it. And Jesus saying in John 9.39, he says to the blind man after he's healed and he can now see, he says to the blind man, I came, I answered into this world to render judgment, to give sight to the blind and to those who think that they see that they are blind. And that's a real challenge right there. You know, um, I've been, you know, I've been on holiday for the past couple of weeks and I've been kind of doing a bit of binge watching, you know, because I'm on holiday. And I've been binge watching Kitchen Nightmares by Gordon Ramsay. Anybody seen that? Like, um, if you're interested in change management, that's just a great thing to watch. Um, there's obviously a bit of colourful language, but hey, it's Gordon Ramsay. Uh, and he's not saved. So, um, but what's interesting is that he'll go into any kind of restaurant that's not doing well. I'll put it this way. A lot of the, the, the people who own the businesses are facing either foreclosure or losing their house, losing everything. And so Gordon kind of just goes in and um, basically helps them get back on his feet, on their feet. But you'll notice that he'll never, he'll never try and change the customers. He'll never try and change the menu or do anything like that. He always seeks to change the owner. And you'll always notice that with the owner or the person that's running the business, that the reason their business is failing isn't because of what's going on around them, it's what's going on in them. There, there, there's a belief, there's a stronghold, or there's a, a lack of belief, or there's a pride issue. You know, you can go through and watch different ones and you can say, well, that's been the issue with that guy, or that's been the issue with this person. And um, what you find is, is that what Gordon does is that he will show that person where the issue is, and it's not until they fix that can their business start to flourish. Here's the deal. It's not really until we see the real stuff that's going on inside of us that's really hindering us. Until we start to see it, then we really can't flourish. So my question that I always kind of got to ask myself is this, is am I blind to things that are ruling my life I don't see? The so Proverbs 2 verse 3 says this, you know, cry out for insight and ask for understanding. And you know, in your daily time alone with God, that's your best place just to get close to the Holy Spirit and say, what am I not seeing? What's, what's going on here? You know, I'm not kind of where I'd like to be. What's got to change? That's called humbling yourself. And here's what I've noticed is that when I, when I pray that kind of prayer, 
you know, now angels don't show up and I get this revelation. It's just like, I can just go on everyday life and, you know, something will go on or something will happen and I start to see, oh, n n now I know where I'm going wrong. And it's not until I fix that can I really start to move ahead. And one of the great things about Jesus is that he is committed to showing you what they are in your life so that you can move from one degree of greatness to the next. And, um, you know, a great prayer that Paul prayed over the Ephesian church is found in Ephesians 1, verses 16 to 18. It won't be up on the screen, but it says this. I have not stopped thanking God for you. I pray for you constantly, asking God, the glorious Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, to give you spiritual wisdom and insight so that you might grow in your knowledge of God. I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light so that you can understand the confident hope he has given to those he called, his holy people, listen to this, who are his rich and glorious inheritance. When's the last time you looked in the mirror and said that you are God's rich and glorious inheritance? Because that is the truth. I got a few chuckles there, but I wonder if that's something that we need to kind of look at. Because so long as we don't believe that, the devil's going to come in with a different strategy and say, yeah, you'll never be that. But according to the word of God, it says something completely different. We see this, when we make prayer, you know, our relationship with Jesus, our first port of call, and another thing in life, listen to this, miracles become your lifestyle. So you've heard of what's going on in my life, you know, got promoted and I got put in a store five minutes away from me. Hey, that's a miracle. I wonder if what God wants to do in your life, that's, you can only turn around and say, God did that. But see, for us, in order to see the rules, the, the, un, you know, the ungodly rulings over our life broken off, we've got to be intentional about that. That's our responsibility. That's within our grip. That's within our reach. And um, it kind of leads me on to my next point is, you know, never put these things off. Never bury your head in the sand. Never go, well, I'm not going to face that problem because it's just too much. Listen, if a problem's too much, then you better face it. It's not going to be comfortable. It's not going to be easy. But listen, when you've got the Spirit of God with you, you can break through anything. In John 9, 4, it says this, we must quickly carry out the tasks assigned us by the one who sent us. Those words, we must quickly carry out. Uh, you know, and if we want to see Jesus break the rules over our own lives, then we've got to take that initiative. And I know if I, you know, if I want to do the work that God has assigned it for my life, effectively and in a timely fashion, then my internal world needs attention. It needs my focus. Because here's the, here's the truth of the matter is this. The breakthroughs that I have in my life, guess what? They can become your breakthrough. That's called discipleship, and that's vice versa. Whatever I struggle with, if you've, if you've beaten it, hey, you can help me with that. See, that's called discipleship. I don't keep these things to myself. I've got to, you know, if somebody else is needing my help with anything and that I've overcome, then I'm obligated to help. My breakthrough becomes your breakthrough and vice versa. So the key of this is let's not get bogged down in the problems and the issues or the pain um, to dictate our lives. In fact, use that pain to motivate us to rise up and overcome. I always notice that in situations like this, the devil will always try to derail your progress by throwing a curveball. You know, whenever you're trying to make progress or take steps, you get thoughts coming in or you get people saying stuff and you say, listen, this isn't you. You're never going to make it. You're never going to overcome it. You're never going to do this. Um, you know, what would happen in my life is, you know, I would, I would get, you know, I would, if I failed at anything, I'd beat myself up emotionally and just go, oh man, you failed, no, no, you're this, you're, 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 you start calling yourself bad names and all that. Yeah, that's not godly, that's not right. But here's what I've discovered is this, is that because the devil is a legalist, so he just looks for an excuse to come in and, and attack and whatever, here's what I've noticed is that it actually re reveals the chinks in the armor. They go, oh, well, actually, there's a problem here, I don't need to fix that. So what you and I can do is we can actually use the enemy as he's tried to destroy us, we can actually use that against him to overcome. What the devil uses to destroy you, God can use to build you. So let's proactively just take the ground in our lives and carry out the task God has for us. You know, Hebrews 12, verses 1 to 3 says this, Since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off some things that hinder us. No, no. 
throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. What's getting in the way? Right now as I'm talking, there's this stuff that's probably just come up. I'll just really encourage you, just go to war on that. And let's not beat around the bush. Let's go, you know what, I'm going to give this thing a couple of days and it's gone. Let's be intentional. Let's, you know, we, we've got everything that we need to overcome. It could be a false belief about yourself. It could be a bad attitude. It could be an addiction, an ungodly way of thinking. Anything that is contrary to what God calls righteous and anything that God knows is not good for your life, let's get rid of it. Because listen, Jesus has made it possible for you and I to live the life that he's called for us. He's paid for it 2,000 years ago at the cross. I used to think the cross is just about me just getting to heaven, and it is. But there's more. So that's just why for us, my third point is this, embrace the completed work of Christ. In John 9, 3, it says it wasn't because of his sins or his parents' sins. This happened so the power of God could be seen in him. So the religious leaders used um, sin as an excuse to do very little for this individual. They used it as an instrument to beat him over the head as a reminder, yeah, the reason you're blind is because you've stuffed up or because somebody stuffed up. That just sounds like the devil to me. To keep him small and insignificant, and that's the same strategy that the devil wants for us is so that we never realize our God-given potential. But I've discovered that the best way to win this is to embrace what Jesus has done for us 2,000 years ago at the cross. See, that reality of the cross is a weapon that we can use to overcome truth. See, what Jesus does is he takes our mess, even if we've slipped up, we've messed up. Jesus takes your mess and turns it into your message. That's how he works. The completed work of the cross is now a tool in our hands to break off anything ungodly that will rule our life right now. And I'm going to read from Romans 6, verses 9 to 13. This is probably one of the most powerful verses of Scripture I've ever come across, but it says this, it should come up on the screen, it says that we are sure of this because Christ was raised from the dead and he will never die again, death no longer has any power over him, when he died, he died once to break the power of sin, but now that he lives, he lives for the glory of God, so you also should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive to God through Christ Jesus. Do not let sin control the way you live. Do not get into it sinful desires. What does that look like in your life? Do not let any part of your body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Instead, give yourselves completely to God, for you were dead, but now you have new life. So use your whole body as an instrument to do what is right for the glory of God. See, the cross empowers us to do one thing, Consider ourselves dead to God. Sorry, dead to sin. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Consider ourselves dead to the power of sin, but alive to God through Christ Jesus. That's the empowering, that is the power of the cross. And, to, you know, thinking about that, you know, you know as a kid growing up, the, my family tradition is a bit of a weird one, and it's, um, but whenever someone dies, what would happen is, is that they would bring the body of the deceased to the house they grew up in. And so the house that I kind of grew up in, there was you know, a few relatives that were there, and so it was, un, it was not unusual to see the deceased. And so I kind of got freaked out about that as a, as a kid. As I grew older, I thought, this is pretty weird, but hey, it's normal. It's kind of cool. That's no, not. But here's what I've discovered about that is... No matter how much you speak to a dead body or whatever, or whatever you do to kind of provoke a response, you get nothing from it because it's dead. Here's the deal. If we're dead to the power of sin, no matter how tempting it might be, or no matter what strategy the devil might throw at you, it cannot respond because you have, been, you have died to it. I used to smoke a lot when I was uh, years ago. I cannot be tempted with smoking anymore because I'm dead to it. I've got no desire for it. I've got no passion to even take it up ever again. Because God's done a work. 
And the same is true for all of us. If we've got ungodly desires that are leading us down dark places, let me tell you something. You can take that desire to the cross and say, God, this thing is killing me. I want you to break this off my life right now. And I can guarantee you he will do it. And God will give you fresh desires for him, fresh desires for a new hope and a new purpose and a new, a new life. Because God is in the business of doing that type of work. Consider yourselves dead to the power of sin. What does that look like in your life? Do you want to use your whole life for the glory of God? Good question to think about this afternoon. Is that what I want my life to be? So I know for that, you know, we need to make Jesus Lord over our whole lives. It's my fourth point. So when you see that back in the verse, Jesus, you know, spat on the ground, made mother, mother saliva. I, I don't know what the Bible interpretation for all that is. It's pretty wacky. Um, but Jesus says to the man, go wash yourself in the pool of Siloam. And of course, the Bible then says, that, so the man went and washed and came back seeing. My question is, is what was it that this man had done to receive his sight? Simply this, he'd done what Jesus told him to do. And the true measure of Christ's lordship over our life is not how often you know, we can show up on a Sunday, though that's good, and, or how often we sit in a serving team. It's the measure is, is how committed we are to living truth in our life, to live in the words, to walk in, to say, oh, if Jesus says this is the thing to do, I'm going to do it. Without question. Hey, that's lordship. That's the measure of it. And that's the best thing that we can do to see the rules, the ungodly rules breaking out over, over our own lives. It's just to simply do what Jesus says to do. The worst thing that we can do is be rebellious and stubborn and go, you're not going to tell me what to do. Stuff that. Nobody tells me what to do. I'm going to do it my way. Trust me, I've been there. And I didn't buy the t-shirt because it was not nice. But it didn't help me. One thing that we can do is reject the stubborn, rebellious spirit and go, you know what? What God has for me is far greater. I'm going to run after him. And I like what Robert preached last week in his message on judgment. The one thing I took away from that was from Luke 640, where it says this, a student is not superior to his teacher, but everyone, this is Jesus speaking, but everyone after he has been completely trained will be like his teacher. That's Jesus saying that. Is that the call of, of being a believer? Is it not to be like Jesus? To be more and more like him? Oh, how can we be like Jesus? I mean, Jesus is God. Yeah. But the great news is that God lives in us. And God can do a work in us. And we can be like him in our actions and our thoughts and our deeds, everything. Words that we use. Romans um, 8 verse 39 says this, For those whom he foreknew, that's us, and loved and chose beforehand, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son and ultimately shared in his complete sanctification so that he would be the firstborn of the most beloved and honored among many believers. Listen to this, the purpose of Jesus being Lord in your life isn't just to have a boss that tells you what to do. Jesus doesn't do that. Jesus' lordship over your life shows you how to overcome and live the way he lives. Do you want that for your life? My question this afternoon is this, is like, what is it that's in your world right now, in your belief system or going on in your heart that is preventing that from being a living, breathing reality? What is it? It's a great exercise to just stop for a minute and come out of the busyness of the day's world and go, all right, God, what is it? Where am I not quite hitting where I need to be? How am I not conforming to the image of your son? I always really encourage you in your daily time alone with God just to really start making those strides. Just get into your journal and just prayerfully just say, hey God, just show me one thing. And I've noticed with God is that he'll just give you one thing to work on. But I want to really encourage you. Let's, you know, let's not ham it out, so to speak. But let's be aggressive and say, right, this thing's coming down. You know, let's be what David was like towards Goliath. He faced down the giant. Hey, I want to encourage you to do the same. Start facing down stuff. Start looking these things in the eye and say, that's it, this thing's coming down. It's been in my life for too long. I'm not swallowing this pill anymore. I'm taking on board what God says, and I'm going to overcome it. Because listen, the truth of the matter is this. If we ignore it, it won't go away. 
In fact, the issue only gets worse. So it's beneficial for us to just really start facing those issues down. The things that keep tripping us up, the sin that keeps tripping us up. You know, it's, it's, it's powerful to understand that you have now, that, that if you're a follower of Christ, listen, sin is now under your feet. He's placed it there 2,000 years ago. So let's not muck around with it. Let's put it in its rightful place out of our lives and let's press forward to what God has for us because that's just going to really take a whole different meaning for your life. If you look at this blind man, you know, you know, he, he, this guy, if, you know, if you read the whole chapter, this guy kind of went on the rampage a little bit. I didn't go mental, but the very fact that Jesus done something in his life caused a lot of problems for the right people. The Pharisees got really upset because Jesus healed on the Sabbath. Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. That's why Jesus is saying, I'm breaking rules. Listen, Jesus wants to break rules on your life. What's ruling your life right now? What has been there for so long that you know about? I want to really encourage you to say, stuff this. I'm done. I'm going to start seeing these things broken off and I'm going to start living for everything that God has for my life. Listen, it's an adventure with God. Nothing boring about it. If you're a believer and life is boring, hey, listen, I'm going to really encourage you. Jesus is in the business of breaking stuff off. Is that cool? Let's pray.